Hi everybody, welcome to a new episode of the vlog. Uh, it's really starting to feel like every other video I put up on this channel is some sort of in memoriam now. Um, I mean, I guess that's just the nature of being into super old music, I guess. But uh, while it is kind of sad, I suppose the uh, jury's still out on whether I'm supposed to be sad for this one. Um, today, of course, I'm talking about Phil Spector. Um, now the late Phil Spector. Um, who is one of the most important innovators in the world of rock and pop music. Uh, but uh, he, uh, let's just say he leaves behind a complicated legacy, um, to say the very least. Um, he's w well known for his triumphs and well known for his failings uh, as a human being, I suppose, as, as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about all of that. Um, he, he got his start in the 50s, uh, in the very earliest days of rock and roll, in a group called the Teddy Bears. I don't know if they can be qualified as rock and roll. They were more of a, like, pop group of the time they had their hit single, which I believe Phil wrote, uh, called To Know Him Is To Love Him. It was an enormous hit. Not my favorite song, personally, but it's an enormous hit. Uh, it hit number one uh, on the pop charts. Uh, but... Despite releasing a few follow-ups, they never seemed to get that success again. They sort of fell into one-hit wonder category, and they split up fairly quickly after that. But in the years that followed, he sort of became known as a studio musician briefly, but more so as a songwriter. In 1960, he co-wrote the uh, Ben E. King hit, Spanish Harlem. I always thought that was a Lieber and Stoller song, but no, it's a Lieber and Spectre composition. He wrote, of course, with Jerry Lieber, um, and it became not just a huge hit, but just a very important song in the development of the soul genre itself. Um, and he continued to write more and more songs for more artists, and that year, in 1960, he founded his own record label called Phil S. Records. Being a combination of his name and Lester Sill, who uh, co-founded that label with him. Uh, and they got to work signing artists, signing many artists over the course of the 1960s. Including the Ronettes, with uh, Ronnie would become his wife, of course, Ronnie Spector. Um, and uh, the Crystals, um, and then eventually the Righteous Brothers as well. But uh, yeah, the Crystals uh, and the Ronettes were... Two of the earlier groups on that label. The Crystals, of course, had hits with songs like "To Do Run Run," and uh, then he hissed me as well. Two major hits, and the Ronettes, of course, had big hits with "Baby I Love You," and uh, with "Be My Baby." There was also "Chapel of Love" by the short-lived group the Dixie Cups. Now, Phil Spector had a very unique um, production style. Uh, first of all, he was totally against. Uh, the new movement of issuing recordings in stereo, particularly on albums. Most singles were still mono at the time, but they were starting to release albums in stereo around that point, and Phil Spector was totally against it, preferring his wall of sound technique, which essentially meant that he would create these lavish arrangements with like a million guitars, uh, you know, bass and drums and an orchestra behind them, and then just just dozens of musicians on every record to create this huge amount of sound. And yeah, he didn't care about stereo, didn't care about panning stuff left and right and creating this like scope of sound. That's what the wall of sound meant. It was, it was all supposed to hit you at once. Um, and it worked. It not only created tremendously successful songs at the time, but uh, many, many musicians for years to come would be influenced by that sound and try to mimic it. Perhaps most notably... Uh, Brian Wilson, when he was producing for the Beach Boys, uh, Phil Spector's production was always on his mind, particularly on Pet Sounds. Uh, he was sort of going for that same uh, wall of sound approach uh, very often. It's said that Brian Wilson, uh, on many occasions, would just uh, sit behind the piano for hours on end playing the same couple, like, Ronette songs over and over, and Crystal songs. Um, yeah. But not only was he against stereo, he was pretty much against the concept of albums entirely. I mean, I have a Righteous Brothers album from Phil S. Records right behind me. Not that they didn't 
release records. They kind of had to to be successful as a record label, but he was all about the singles. He didn't care about packaging songs for albums. He was all about what song, uh, you know, will be the next hit. Um, well, there's one exception to that, one notable exception to that as far as the 60s goes, and that's the uh, Christmas Gift album released by uh, Phyllis Records in 1963, which did not sell particularly well at that time, but has become a perennial favorite. I personally notice that every year, if I go to like the local Sunrise Records or whatever, new copies of that Christmas album are still all over the shelves today. One of the later uh, signings to Phyllis Records in the mid-60s was uh, the group I previously mentioned, uh, the Righteous Brothers, who he had apparently met when they were opening for the Ronettes on a tour in 1963, and um, loved them, signed them, and produced some massive hits for them, including uh, You've Lost That Love and Feelin', which I've read that that song, which was released in 1965, enormous hit, I've read that that song was the most played song on radio in the 20th century. Now, don't quote me on that. I, that's one of those facts that I feel like I read at some point, um, which shocked me because I would have figured it would be like either Beatles, Elvis, or Sinatra. It surprised me that it was a Righteous Brothers tune, but that song was enormously, enormously popular. They also did the song Unchained Melody after that. And then in 1966, they signed the Ike and Tina Turner Review, uh, who had already had some success. But they, of course, cranked that success to a new level with their Phil Spector-produced River Deep Mountain High, um, which became, I believe, Phil Spector considered that track to be his greatest record. Also in 1966, my favorite uh, Phil Spector uh, written-slash-produced song ever and that's the song This Could Be The Night by the Modern Folk Quartet. Uh, that song wound up being the theme song to the Big TNT show, which was sort of a follow-up concert to the Tammy show, which had been done a couple years earlier. Um, I don't know. There's just something about that song that I love. Uh, definitely check that one out. After that, uh, Phil became increasingly uh, reclusive over the years, uh, although he did emerge in 1969 when he attempted to revive the Ronettes to really limited success. But I believe it was around that time that uh, John Lennon approached him to produce his latest single, which was going to be uh, Instant Karma, AKA We All Shine On. Uh, that song was great. And uh, John Lennon loved it so much that he said, hey, we've got this uh, album that we just can't seem to finish. The album is called Get Back. Do you want to take a look at these sessions and maybe see if you can produce these tracks yourself? And he did. And that album would eventually go on to be called Let It Be, the last release uh, during the Beatles' career, released in May of 1970, and uh, produced by Phil Spector. Um, although the original recordings were supervised and produced, uh, of course, by the Beatles' a longtime producer, George Martin, it was Phil Spector who went back over the tapes and created the final mix. Um, John Lennon loved it. I know George Harrison loved it. I know Paul McCartney hated it. Uh, really, really loathed it, uh, particularly due to his handling of the song The Long and Winding Road, which Paul had intended in being a very stripped down, just piano and voice track, and Phil Spector, as he does, added a full-blown orchestral arrangement behind it, which was not what Paul wanted. Um, to the point where, um, about probably 10 or 15 years ago, uh, Paul McCartney went back, stripped all the Phil Spector-y production away from it, and put out the album Let It Be Naked, which was uh, the album as he had pretty much originally intended it. Uh, I've never actually gotten around to giving that album a listen. I really should. Um, let me know in the comments if you check that one out. Um, but in any case, Phil Spector continued to work with John Lennon and George Harrison, uh, for George, he uh, produced um, the All Things Must Pass triple album, the um, which is one of the great albums in rock history, and uh, also produced the concert for Bangladesh, which included not only uh, George Harrison and Ringo Starr, but also other musicians, most notably Bob Dylan. 
And then for John Lennon, he produced many more things, uh, probably most notably Imagine. Um, also, you know, Happy Christmas, War is Over. He was pretty much uh, John Lennon's main producer until about 1973, uh, when he left during the sessions for what would become the Rock and Roll album. And then this began another period of Phil Spector being sort of reclusive. He emerged uh, one more time in the late 70s uh, when he produced uh, a Leonard Cohen album called Death of a Ladies Man in 1977. I've again not heard that record either, but I know that Leonard Cohen fans hate it, or at least hated it when it came out because Leonard Cohen is another one of those artists known for the stripped down arrangements and uh, Phil Spector is not, and he created a very pop-friendly, very layered production that seemed to go against uh, some of the things that Leonard Cohen's fans loved about his music. I think that album may have maybe a little bit more favorably remembered nowadays than it was uh, received when it first came out, but uh, in any case, it was rather controversial. And speaking of controversial, two years later, um, he worked with the Ramones on an album uh, called End of a Century, and again turned the Ramones sound into a, a radio-friendly, pop-driven sound. I mean, speaking of radio-friendly, I mean, do you remember Rock and Roll Radio was the big hit off that record? And then after John Lennon's Untimely Death in 1980, he produced Yoko Ono's next album after that. But throughout the 80s, 90s, 2000s, he pretty much, uh, once again, uh, for a long time, stepped away from public life, became totally reclusive until uh, a certain event occurred in 2003. I don't know how much I want to get into it, but uh, we all know about the Phil Spector murder conviction. Yes, uh, he was convicted for the murder of Lana Clarkson, uh, which took place at his home in 2003. Uh, the trial took place over the course of about five years, uh, in which Phil Spector famously wore a whole bunch of really outlandish wigs, partially just because, well, he was a very eccentric, I guess, dude, more than eccentric, I mean, he's convicted to have killed someone, um, maybe eccentric, maybe we shouldn't give him cutesy names like eccentric, should we? Anyway, uh, but also he, he had fairly severe, uh, head injuries from a, a car accident he suffered in 1974, I believe he went through the windshield and was almost uh, pronounced dead on the scene. That was his reason he always gave for wearing big giant wigs and stuff to cover up the scars. Anyway, in any case, the wigs are not the main point of that story. The main point is that he was convicted for that in 2008, and, uh, well, he began to, I believe in 2009, he began serving time, uh, for that. He was effectively given a life sentence. Uh, he was due to come up for parole in 2024, at which point he would have been like 84 years old uh, if that had even passed. Um, but as we now know, he did not make it that long. And in the end, it was COVID-19 that wound up taking his life. That's pretty crazy. Uh, just died, of course, yesterday, two days ago, whatever January 16th was uh, of this year at the age of 81, like I said, from COVID-19. Hard to be too sad about it. Again, this is a convicted murderer we're talking about, but it's one of those situations where it's so hard to separate art from the artist because, yeah, rock and roll would not sound the way it does now if it wasn't for the innovation and the vision of Phil Spector. But, man, it's hard to feel right uh, giving him praise and support, you know? Anyway, he's gone now. Um... COVID takes another one, I guess. Um, and with that, that'll do it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's just one of those things that it's hard to come to a consensus on. But there you have it. There's the story of Phil Spector, which we now know the closing chapter to. Thanks so much for watching. And I'll catch you guys with another new video again real soon.